Welcome to another edition of Logic Made Lucid with Dr. Jacob Waldenmeyer. Previously, we've been reviewing arguments that are deductive. In other words, arguments where we want to ensure that the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. But now we're going to move along to... So an inductive or analogical argument gathers evidence and anticipates a conclusion. The conclusion of an argument like this could take uh, one of two forms. It could be an analog that applies to an instance of a category, so say the next instance after a number of examples. It could also be a generalization that applies to all instances of a, of a category. Here, we are avoiding a fallacy. The fallacy is a hasty generalization. We're trying not to do that. We're trying to ensure that we are making an argument that constitutes a reasonable generalization, a justified generalization. And we're going to talk how we do that in this video. So we might, for example, take, uh, say, primary analog A, right? So some, some reasons or some sets of reasons, A, B, and C. These are different kinds of uh, examples that we might have or pieces of evidence that we might have towards an argument. And then our conclusion would be something like some sort of secondary analog on the left or some sort of inductive generalization that we might make based on the evidence. So just as an example, let's say, let's take F to mean the predicate has feathers and W to mean the predicate has wings, right? So let's say sample A has feathers and has wings. Sample B has feathers and has B has wings. Sample C would have feathers and have wings. And sample D has feathers and D has wings, right? Well we may be able to conclude that if sample E has feather, feathers, then sample E will have wings, right? Or we can say on the right, if something has feathers, then it also has wings, or anything with feathers also has wings, right? These are two different ways that we can go with this. We can use the analogical pathway, which will give us an instantiation or the next instantiation of the, the, the subject, or, uh, we can you make a generalization that would say that, hey, it looks as though everything with feathers has wings, right? Uh, now, in both cases, we want to stress that we're talking about probabilities. We don't know for sure. These are not deductive arguments where the conclusion necessarily follows. They are inductive arguments where the conclusion probably follows. And now there are different levels. There are different degrees, different strengths of inductive, inductive arguments. With induction, we're not so much talking about valid versus invalid. We're not. That's kind of a binary matter. Here, we're talking about more degree, right? We're talking about in terms of scale. Strength versus weakness would describe inductive and analogical arguments. They are made, they're evaluated by scale, right? An inductive or an analogical argument is strong if there's ample evidence to support the conclusion and exceptions to, uh, to the evidence that you've gathered are rare or trivial or irrelevant. Right? Inductive argument is weak if the evidence is sparse or not directly related to the conclusion. We're going to talk all about that in this video. Or there are major exceptions to the premises. That, then the inductive argument is weak. Right? So just as uh, some examples, right? So here is an example of a, a you know, fairly strong argument. We could say, Cell division by mitosis has occurred continuously in our ecosystem for many years. And so mitosis will continue to occur tomorrow. All right, so it's, a, it's an argument that's based on lots of evidence and then the conclusion extends from that. And we might say as uh, some of our reasons, well, mitosis occurs often and routinely and its, its continuation follows naturally. Exceptions to mitosis, exceptions to this pattern, which would be, say, cell death or malfunctioning cells that don't happen to reproduce by mitosis, uh, they don't occur everywhere. We're not expecting everything to suddenly die and stop dividing by mitosis overnight. We're not expecting that. So it's a strong argument for these reasons. Now, what if we were to say, uh, for example, the two Green Party members I have met were very rude, so the next Green Party member I meet will be rude, right? This is a weak inductive argument because the number of Green Party members I've met is insignificant. I've only met two of them, let's say. Now, I've met more than them, but let's say, for example, my argument only involves a sample size of two. And also, rudeness often changes between meetings and between people. Sometimes we have bad days, right? So there are lots of reasons to point out 
that this argument is weak because the sample size is low, there are lots of possible contingencies and uh, lots of possible exceptions to my argument. Remember the, the conclusion of this is, um, the conclusion of this argument is that the next Green Party member I meet will be rude, right? But that's not really a very well justified argument based on the small amount of evidence that I have. All right, now there are six principles that we'll talk about that make an inductive argument or an analogical argument strong, right? So let's take, for example, let's, let's express an argument like this using some of the predicate symbolism or symbology that we had been using in previous videos, right? So we've got um, samples A through M, uh, and they have qualities A, B, C, and D. You could see the in the predicates there. And then we've got sample N, which has qualities A, B, and C. And then we might say, well, then, therefore, it probably has quality D as well, right? If we were to use some sort of argument like this, right? A through M have properties A, B, C, and D. N has properties A, B, and C. So N probably also has property D. This is almost like we heard of the colloquialism if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and uh, looks like a duck, then it's probably a duck, right? And this, this sort of argument, right? It's an inductive argument. So here are the six criteria that determine whether an inductive argument is strong. Number one, relevance. We need to make sure that the analogs and the attributes, the evidence actually does relate to the conclusion. Right? Second of all, attributes. And we're gonna go into these in, in great detail uh, soon. And we want to look at the, the attributes. We want to see that the, the primary analogs, which are basically the evidence that we're using towards a conclusion, we want to make sure that they have similarities that matter, that they are material similarities, not, not just trivial similarities, but similarities that matter for the conclusion that we're drawing. Also, we want to see that there are multiple primary analogs. We need a good sample size. We need a number of pieces of evidence in order to make a form or to form a strong inductive argument. We also should look for diversity. We should look for evidence that is consistent in a variety of instances. Again, we'll talk more about this soon. We're also gonna look for disanalogies. These are counterexamples or errors. And we, a strong inductive argument may include some counterexamples, but those might be weak, few, or irrelevant. Right? And finally, we wanna look at the scope of the conclusion. We wanna make sure that the, the range of the everything that we're talking about in the conclusion aligns with the scope of the premises. We want to we don't want to make an overstatement or an understatement. We don't want to make something make a statement that's so precise that is very very unlikely to be the case and so forth. Again, more about that soon. So let's use an example, right? Here's an example of an inductive argument and then we're going to uh, we're going to analyze this using the six criteria, right? So let's say uh, premise 1. Frank has performed hundreds of successful lung surgeries, right? So now notice our sample size is gonna be pretty good because we're talking about hundreds of successful lung surgeries, hundreds, two. Uh, oh yeah, and here's the symbolism, uh, the, uh, the, the, the predicate form of this in the lower right in the box. Uh, two, Frank has performed two unsuccessful lung surgeries, okay? So there are a couple of cases where the lung surgeries were unsuccessful, right? All right, now we could draw as our conclusion and there are going to be two possible conclusions that we could draw. One of them, Frank's next lung surgery will probably be successful. That's one conclusion we can draw, right? That's and that's the analogical kind of instantiation of uh, the uh, of the next uh, next uh, of our conclusion. Or we can make a general conclusion, which would be Frank generally performs lung surgeries successfully. Right? We could say that. Now notice that be, either of these can sort of follow. Now notice they don't necessarily follow. We can't prove them. Uh, we're not, we can't be absolutely sure. However, we can be reasonably confident that they follow, right? That Frank's next lung surgery will probably be successful. And Frank generally performs lung surgeries successful. One is an analog, analog one is a generalization, right? Okay, so let's check this, right? Let's check for relevance, right? So you see the expression up here. Relevance means that the primary analogs and attributes relate to the conclusion. The conclusion. So let's take a look. The primary analogs, what do they involve? They involve the success of surgeries on lungs performed by Frank. Right? That's what they are all about. The secondary analog, which is our conclusion, uh, and, the, and the generalization, they involve whether the next surgery on lungs performed by Frank will be successful or whether Frank generally performs surgery on lungs successfully. Now notice I've underlined these attributes of the, the primary analogs and the secondary analog or the, and the generalization. 
notice we can we can show that they are very much relevant, right? Success appears both in the primary analogs and the secondary analog, surgeries, lungs, frank, right? Success, success and successfully, these are there. There are matches between the primary analogs and the secondary analog or the generalization. So we can say then that they have strong relevance, right? The, the conclusion is strongly relevant to the premises and, and vice versa. Right? Okay, now. Um, what if, on the other hand, let's say our argument were a little bit different. Let's say that instead of Frank having performed hundreds of successful lung surgeries, let's say we have a weaker relevance by saying that Frank has performed hundreds of successful lung treatments. Right? Now notice the, the, the conclusions are the same, that Frank's next lung surgery will probably be successful. Well, now we are, our primary analogs involve treatments but our conclusion still involves surgeries. So that's, there's weaker relevance there. The argument has become weaker because it's been changed in these ways. Uh, there's no longer a clear um, a, or as straight a relevance between the, the premises and the conclusion. Now, what if we changed it even further? Let's say um, uh, Frank's next eye surgery as the conclusion, next eye surgery will probably be successful. Uh, or Frank's generally performs eye surgery successful. This makes the argument even weaker because now the argument is even less relevant, right? The, the conclusion is even less relevant to the premises, right? So we've got a super weak argument. Now let's make it even weaker. Let's say we were to draw a conclusion that says Frank's colleagues are successful lung surgeons, right? Well, we haven't really said anything about Frank's colleagues in the premises. We haven't introduced any evidence or any reasons to think anything about Frank's colleagues. So this is a very, very irrelevant conclusion, right? So this, is a, this would be a very weak analogical or inductive argument uh, if we were to, to treat it this way or form it this way. All right, next criterion, common attributes. So if we want to uh, see that the, the common attributes are strong, the argument's strong based on them, we want to see that the prim primary analogs, we're, we're now we're only looking at the evidence here, that they share material similarities, right? That they are similar in certain ways that, are, that build up the argument. Um, you can almost think of it as a as a tower, right? And these are, the evidence is like the mountain on top of which the conclusion rests. So uh, we can see that the primary analogs, which are surgeries, they have three explicit similarities, right? They were performed by Frank on lungs and were successful mostly, right? Those are three attributes, by Frank, lungs, and successful. Those are three. So we see them there. So now adding similarity between the analogs will strengthen the argument. Let's say I added more analogs. I said, and, they are performed in the same hospital with the same surgical team, right? So now there are even more common attributes and similarities between uh, these analogs, all right? Formed in the hospital with the same surgical team. Now notice, when I talk about the strength of an argument based on common attributes, the similarities still must be relevant to the conclusion. I don't wanna have given that up in order to add these, uh, these common attributes. So notice in the, in the right, in the, uh, the diagram of the argument, I've carried forward those, um, those, those common attributes that they was in the same hospital with the same surgical team. I've carried those forward into the conclusion in order to keep the conclusion relevant to the premises. All right. Now, um, primary analogs, all right? Another attribute that we're gonna look for, uh, the number of primary analogs here. So we wanna see that there are, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence that our sample size is pretty good. And indeed, in this argument, there are hundreds of primary analogs because we've referred to hundreds of successful lung surgeries that Frank, Frank has performed. Right? So this makes the argument quite strong because we've got hundreds of examples of successful lung surgeries. Right? Sample size is big. Increasing the number of primary analogs strengthens an argument. Right? Decreasing the number of analogs weakens the argument. Right? It should be fairly straightforward. And of course, again to note, the analogs should remain relevant and similar in the ways we've described before. Okay, another criterion, diversity, right? Remember, diversity checks to see whether attributes are consistent in a variety of instances. And that will end up strengthening our argument if we can see that it holds in many different situations. Diversification improves the credibility of the primary analogs. It shows the versatility of primary analogs, improves your sampling, and checks against, and sometimes rules out, possible exceptions. Remember, that's going to be another step. We're going to look for possible exceptions or possible counterexamples, possible disanalogies, as we're going to call them. 
So one of the things we could do to add to the diversity of this argument, we could add that Frank's successful surgeries were conducted in a variety of settings and with different teams. Now notice, that you may notice that this is a little interesting because earlier, hadn't we said that if Frank's surgeries were performed in the same hospital with the same team, then that builds the argument? Sure, but it can also strengthen an argument to show that Frank has, has performed the surgery in a number of settings at different hospitals with different teams, because that will add to the, uh, to, to the likelihood that his next surgeries, or that his general performance of surgeries, has been is being success is, will be successful regardless of what setting he performs them in, right? Also, yeah, on patients with diverse medical histories and underlying conditions, if that's the case, then it shows that Frank is generally a good um, lung surgeon. Right? All right, so this is strong diversity. Now, what about what if we were to change things a little bit? What if there were a limited diversity? What if we found that um, that that uh, there was something that was fairly uniform about Frank's surgeries. Homogeneity in primary analogs weakens an argument in some cases. So if we learn that Frank's successful surgeries were performed mostly on, say, low-risk patients aged 45 or younger, right? So let's add that to the um, to the diagram of the argument. Well, here, notice uh, we've got okay, we're we're pointing out all these successful lung surgeries, but hang on a second. They were successful, and but they were mostly on low-risk patients aged 45 or younger. So we're we're limiting the diversity because we're making we're specifying that his successful lung surgeries were only under these circumstances. Maybe if we remove those circumstances, his next lung surgery will not be so successful, or re reduces the chances that his next lung surgery is going to be successful. Right. So. A generalized statement or a prediction about Frank's next surgery would be less certain. We can't be so sure. Now there is a way to correct this, or there is a way to um, to recover some of the strength in this argument, even though we've now weakened it because of diversity. One of the ways we could do that is by modifying the conclusion that in such a way that it accommodates this. So notice here uh, we've okay. Well, I'll just move forward. So disanalogies are the next thing that we want to look at. Right? Disanalogies are counter examples, right? They are, they are errors in the argument. And we want to make sure that they are they're weak or irrelevant or that there aren't very many of them. And when there are a few of them, uh, or preferably none of them, that strengthens our argument further, right? So um, in this case, we've already put a disanalogy into the argument. We've said that there were two unsuccessful lung surgeries, right? So these are disanalogies. They weaken the argument, right? So they, these, are, these are recognized, right? Now, the argument remains strong because for many surgeons, we can expect a few surgeries to be unsuccessful, right? It's not a big deal if there are a couple of surgeries out of, a, out of you know, hundreds that were unsuccessful, right? Only two successful, unsuccessful surgeries. Shows that exceptions to the conclusion are rare, right? So the paucity or the smallness or the limited number of counterexamples actually strengthens this argument. Okay? All right, so what about disanalogies that would indeed significantly weaken the argument? If we learn that the unsuccessful surgeries were actually the two most recent surgeries, so he had hundreds of successful lung surgeries, and then suddenly there are these two most recent lung surgeries that were unsuccessful. If that were part of our disanalogies, that would be significant, right? Those disanalogies become more relevant because they raise the possibility of new impediments to success. Right? Other possible disanalogies include, let's say we learned that the, there was an underreporting of errors or other unsuccessful surgeries. Let's say we learned that Frank's uh, having performed the surgeries under the guidance of a specialist or a supervisor, that may also undermine the argument um, if we, if the next lung surgery might not be under such guidance, you know, or it could be understood a different way, right? Or other information that may challenge a surgeon's competence, right? Those would be counterexamples, or those would be disanalogies that would then start to weaken the argument. It would weaken the integrity of Frank's ability to successfully perform lung surgeries. Okay, so another thing that we check for is whether the conclusion 
is broad or specific enough in a way that aligns with the premises. We want to check the scope of the conclusion, right? So in our case, in the argument that we've been looking at, the specificity of the conclusion needs to align with the premises, right? Now, what if we were to, uh, to offer conclusions like this that deviate rather far from the premises? Let's say we were to say that, um, that, that our conclusion were Frank will perform 30 more successful surgeries. Well, okay, we can say that that's fairly likely. Um, but remember, the original argument was that Frank's next lung surgery will probably be successful. But now we're kind of overshooting. We're, say, we're saying Frank will perform 30 more successful surgeries. That starts to weaken our argument a little bit because now we're, 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 we've moved from the next lung surgery to 30 more successful surgeries. Right? Now we might even weaken it even further by saying all su subsequent surgeries will be successful. Well, and we can't really say that. Right? That's, a, that's a weaker conclusion. And we might say, uh, okay, there could be reasons to hope that that would be the case, but it's not necessarily a very strong conclusion based on the evidence. Right? Um, now, what if we were to say few subsequent surgeries will be successful? That's another weak conclusion, because again, we're talking about hundreds of successful lung surgeries. So we really couldn't say that few subsequent surgeries will be successful. Right? That would be a weak conclusion. Still weaker, no subsequent surgeries will be successful. It's a very, very weak conclusion. Right? Because and imagine, we might imagine that that's based on the two unsuccessful lung surgeries, and then, but then based on all the hundreds of lung, successful lung surgeries, it would be unreasonable to say that no subsequent surgeries will be successful. And then finally, another weak conclusion, Frank is finished performing surgery. That's a very, very weak conclusion. It doesn't even really follow from the premises. There's no indication that Frank is finished performing surgery. Okay, checking for the scope of the conclusion. In these cases, these, all these examples weakened the conclusion of the argument. All right, so just to summarize everything that we've been talking about here in this video, and you can kind of wrap it up in a nice, neat little bow by saying this. Now, this is a kind of a large, complicated sentence, but it sort of does encapsulate much of what we've been talking about. An inductive or analogical argument is strong if there is a significant number of materially relevant similarities between a significant number of primary analogs in diverse situations and the secondary analog or generalization which altogether support a modest conclusion with few or no material differences. All right, that's in a nutshell what we're talking about when we refer to a strong inductive or analogical argument. All right, so there is a way to visualize this. Now, this is a lot of information. There's a lot of details, a lot of criteria. There's a way to kind of picture what's happening when we analyze or assess or critique or evaluate an inductive argument. So let's say we've got an inductive argument like this, right? So uh, P uh, is both A, B, C, and D. Q is both A, B, C, and D. Right? R is A, B, C, and D. And then we've got S is A, B, and C. Okay, well, and then the conclusion might be that it's also going to be D. Right? Let's say that. Let's take this as, you know, more or less the, the, the way of, uh, of, of describing or representing an argument, right? An inductive argument. Okay. So now that's the first, the DS is the analog, the analogical conclusion, but then uh, A and B and C uh, imply D for anything. That's the generalization that we could draw from this evidence, right? Okay, so the first thing we do, we check for relevance. We make sure that the conclusion is relevant to the premises, right? And in, in this case, it is, right? We also check to see that there are multiple analogs. In this case, we've got three, three pieces of evidence. And then this fourth item, a, B, and C, well, therefore D as well. Now we look for multiple similarities. Well, we've got four here, right? So it it's, makes it reasonably strong. And we also wanna look for the similarities between those analogs, right? So notice, so just to recap so far, relevance between premises and conclusion, the number of analogs we have on the left, the similarities between those analogs, we wanna check that there are a number of similarities. And then, then we want to look at the similarity between those analogs, right? We want to see, and in many of these cases, we are checking for consistency and we are checking for breadth, right? So we have breadth, meaning that we've got lots of, lots of examples, many samples, and consistency, meaning that when we, when we refer to, to CP and CQ and CR, we want to make sure that C really does refer to pretty much the same thing across those analogs or across those examples. And then also we might add FP and GQ, 
and H are, right? What we're doing here is we're seeing diversity, right? That these, these attributes hold and they are, they're, they're, they're held in common even in diverse situations. Now, whatever F and G and H mean doesn't really matter so much, but it supports the argument. It would, it would make, strengthen the argument because it shows that these attributes hold together even in many, many different circumstances. All right, now we're gonna see a much more detailed argument in a moment that uh, pl plays that up a lot. How about this one? A, T, uh, let's say there's a sample T, and let's say it has attributes A and B, but not C, right? In this case, we're looking at a counterexample, right? We might seek any counterexamples. And then finally, we wanna look at the scope of the conclusion, right? So these really are the different kinds of things we look for in order to analyze in order to critique, in order to assess, in order to evaluate an inductive or analogical argument. Okay. Oh, and this is, uh, these are just more attributes. This starts to move us a little bit into a description of what could look like a scientific experiment. A lot of the time we want something that is, uh, is consistent. We want something that's controlled, right? We don't want, we don't want too many variables. We want something that's, uh, we want something that's substantive with plenty of evidence, large sample size. We want something that is randomized. You see that on the, on the right, diversity is a way of uh, having a randomized sample and so forth. I mean, there are many different situations. Counterexamples, we wanna look for any possible exceptions. We wanna make sure that the scope of our conclusion is warranted and so forth. Just as another note. All right, so here's an example. Let's take an argument, right? That, uh, and, and let's look at an actual argument uh, through with these six criteria. Now we sort of already did that with the, the Frank performing lung surgery argument. But here I want to I want to take an argument which is um, maybe some of you will find interesting, and and let's let's assess it let's let's check its strength and maybe correct it if we find that it's a little bit too weak and correct it in ways that could make it stronger. And I'm going to try my very best to use uh, facts right to use actual evidence that's out there. And we're going to see that there are there's more to this conversation based on this argument. There's a lot more to be said about this. However, I just want to make an argument and you know, test it. So here we go. Here's the argument. Socialist countries have healthy economies. The economies of the four countries with Marxist governments and of the countries that are constitutionally socialist grew fairly consistently over the last decade. All right, so now you'll remember in our discussion of when we look at paragraphs or when we look at arguments, you hopefully can clearly identify what the conclusion is in this argument. What is the point? Well, the point of this argument is that socialist countries have healthy economies. That's the point. The reasons for that are the other the other parts. Um, so this is the point. Socialist economies, countries have healthy economies. But the reasons why one might draw that conclusion are that the, the economies of the four countries with Marxist governments and the countries that are constitutionally socialist and of the constitution, the countries that are some country to, constitutionally socialist, I'm tripping over my words, grew fairly consistently over the last decade. So we're talking about the economies of these countries that are socialist in a couple of different ways. Okay. So to symbolically represent this, we could say, we'll, we'll use this language. S means socialist, M as a predicate means Marxist, and G as a predicate means growing, right? A growing economy. So now the, this lowercase c, that's going to be a subject, i.e. a constant, that represents China. China is a country that is socialist, that is Marxist, and that has a growing economy. Okay, now also other examples. Vietnam is socialist, Marxist, and has a growing economy. Laos is socialist, Marxist, and has a growing economy. And then finally, I need, uh, there's a, the fourth country that has a distinctly Marxist government uh, that, uh, and, and a growing economy. And uh, as far as I can tell, there are really only four distinctly Marxist governments. And this final one is Cuba. Now, I already used C, so I didn't want to use C again. That would be a little bit confusing. So I wanted to use U to represent Cuba. So China, Vietnam, Laos, and Cuba have distinctly Marxist governments, and they have growing economies, and they are socialist. Right? Okay, so now let's also look at the other set that is mentioned in the argument. Constitutionally social, socialist countries. These are countries whose constitutions identify them as socialist nations, right? So one of them is this I stands for India. India is, India's constitution refers to it as a socialist country and it has a growing economy. Bangladesh, socialist, 
constitutionally socialist and has a growing economy so forth portugal same thing all right now this final example socialist identifies constitutionally as socialist and does not have a consistently growing economy over the last decade and remember g refers to an economy that grew fairly consistently over the last decade that is not the case for nicaragua even though nicaragua is socialist and identifies itself as such in the constitution so we'll talk about this right so in a sense the fact that there is this counterexample is going to weaken the argument but then we're going to talk about how to how to come back around and to modify the argument in order to strengthen it so we'll see all about that now the conclusion is right just as we saw at the top socialist countries have healthy economies that's the conclusion that we're looking at okay now you might already be able to spot potential problems just in the wording of this right so let's take a look at this here's what we're going to do we're going to take our argument there's the argument there and here it is i'm going to put all of everything in a vertical line right there's the line and there's the conclusion um, that any any government that is socialist right, any nation that is socialist it has a healthy economy sx implies hx right now on the right in the box on the right i'm going to keep track of weakness versus strength in these different attributes now as a reminder the attributes we're going to be looking for are relevance between the premises and conclusion we're going to look be looking at the number of primary analogs we're going to be looking at the number of similarities between those analogs we're going to be looking at the similarities between analogs right you'll be able to see this graphically pretty soon We'll be looking at diversity. We'll be looking at possible counterexamples or exceptions, or maybe even defeaters. And we'll look at the conclusion, the scope of the conclusion, right? We're gonna analyze this argument for all of these things. Okay, so first, the relevance. Are the premises relevant to the conclusion, right? Well, kind of, but not really. We could say that this is a more or less a weak conclusion. Now, we might say that, well, hey, isn't it the case that a growing economy means that you've got a healthy economy? Not necessarily. Now, we could say that uh, a growing economy implies a healthy economy. We could say that. And so any socialist economy uh, that is growing, uh, if, if, if an economy is socialist, then it is growing, has a growing economy. And if it has a growing economy, then it has a healthy economy. And so by hypothetical syllogism, we went over this when we were discussing the rules of inference by hypothetical syllogism, we could say maybe that is if if a country has a socialist economy, then it has a healthy economy. However, there are reasons to be suspicious of this because a healthy economy involves more things than simply growth, right? It involves growth. It involves um, you know strong employment, right? What does the employment look like? So E could represent that. P represents the poverty level. We want to make sure that poverty is low. That's also a sign of a healthy economy. And then also I for investments. Are people investing in the economy? Those are important factors that determine whether an economy is healthy. All right. So we might be biting off more than we can chew by saying that if an economy is socialist, then it is healthy, especially when we're looking at the relevance of that compared to our premises. Notice our premises are really talking about economic growth. They're not really talking more broadly about a healthy economy. They're just looking at growth. So in order to correct that, in order to make this argument a little stronger, we can change the conclusion. Notice in the upper right, I've changed uh, healthy to growing economies. And look in the lower left, we can see we can change that to a GX. XX implies GX. So that would be a generalized conclusion saying that if a country is socialist then it has a growing economy that's a that's a generalization right now that makes the the, uh, the conclusion stronger now now we're and now we're only talking about relevance here right we're not talking about the entire argument we're talking about relevance here the conclusion is strongly relevant to the premises okay all right so we've we've adjusted the argument in order to make it to give it a stronger relevance all right now we also want to look at the number of analogs right so we can see we've got seven um seven clear analogs seven clear pieces of evidence here uh, that that justify the correlation between a socialist uh, country and a growing economy but then notice we also have this outlier here we've got a country that has a socialist economy but not has not seen consistent growth over the last decade right again g means has seen fairly consistent growth growth over the last decade 
Nicaragua, again, is an exception, okay? And again, we're going to deal with that shortly. But we do have seven, uh, seven pieces of evidence, and, you know, we're talking about the few countries in the world that are, uh, that are socialist and that have growing economies. I want to mention also, it's worth noting that there are nine additional countries that are socialist, that whose constitutions identify them as such, and that may either be growing or not growing, right? Those are, those are other things that I would, it would be valuable to look into, but for the purposes of our argument here and for the purposes of this demonstration, I didn't want to get into the, the weeds that much. However, it would be very interesting to look at this statistically. Later on, when we talk about probability and statistics, we can definitely get into this more deeply. But suffice it to say, there are other socialist countries that identify themselves as such through other constitutions that may or may not be growing. All right, now, because of the number of analogies, we can say that this argument is fairly strong based on the number of, of analogies, right? Okay, now we look at the number of similarities between those analogs, right? So we've got socialist, and then we've got mm, uh, identifies as, themselves as communist by their constitution, or they are Marxist, in which case they're also um, a socialist. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I said communist earlier, but if they're Marxist, they're certainly communist. And then a growing economy, right? And this here, and we've got, we could say two and a half, right? I say two and a half because we got socialism, we've got growing economy, but notice the middle column, those middle analogs, they don't, they're not exactly the same. They're similar, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, the difference, and the difference falls be, is a matter of whether it has a Marxist economy, or I'm sorry, whether it is a Marxist nation, uh, or whether it identifies itself as socialist in its constitution. Those are very similar things uh, in, if we're talking about socialism. There are different styles of socialism, we could say, but socialism nonetheless. So let's call that two and a half. Now, the number of similarities, we might say that that's about neutral, right? We, and you may, may remember the earlier argument that I made, I think probably one of the first ones, about the feathers and the wings. We really only needed two uh, similarities in order to form a decent argument about how anything that has feathers has wings. Actually, incidentally, that is the case. If something has feathers, it has wings. Okay. Um, all right, so next, we also want to look into the similarities between the analogs. So notice the, uh, the the similarities between socialism in the case of China, similarities between socialism in the case of Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, India, Bangladesh, Portugal, Nicaragua. Socialism is very similar of a, a concept. Really, we're talking about you know definitionally the idea that the working class um, generally or or the public we want to say that uh, is in control of. Uh, the means of production to some extent. Now, some, in some cases, the public owns the means of production. In some cases, they are able to control or regulate the means of production in certain ways. Uh, uh, either way, we're talking about some kind of socialist approach to the means of production, right? So they're roughly similar. Now, notice here, we've got the Marxist cases. Those are very similar. And then we've got the cases in which they identify as socialist in their constitutions. Those are similar in and of themselves, right? But notice they're not quite exactly the same. So I'm, I use different colors for those similarities between those analogs, right? And then finally, economic growth, very close in many cases. Now notice the slight uh, changes in colorization. That's because, you know, no two economies are growing exactly at the same rate, right? Almost definitely. However, they are growing. And notice I did not include that outlier, Nicaragua, because it is not growing, right? Or, or it has not seen consistent growth over the last decade, right? Okay. So for the similarities between analogs, we can see a lot of similarities, and they are material similarities. So we can say that this is fairly strong, right? Socialism is fairly uniform across uh, these examples, and growing economy is fairly uniform across many of these examples. Marxism is fairly uniform. Constitutional socialism is fairly uniform. Fairly, right? Again, it's strong. It's not a perfect argument, but it's certainly not a weak argument in this case, right, in the similarities between analogies, all right? Okay, so now you'll notice, again, we want to focus now on these differences between Marxism and uh, constitutional socialism, right? Notice, this contributes to our diversity argument, right? This shows that socialist uh, countries have growing economies regardless of whether they are distinctly Marxist or whether they identify themselves as socialist in their constitutions. Either way, 
So we have a little bit of diversity here. We have a, 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 a broader, a little bit more randomized of a set of, 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 of analogs, right? Now, what if also we were to point out other attributes? Well, what if we were to add some more attributes here? And so let's say L can mean large in its population, right? They have a, a large population. They have a lot of people. China certainly does. Um, India certainly has a very large population. Bangladesh also, we could say, has a large population. So we see that some of these analogs are countries that are fairly large. Well, so now one might say, hang on a second, maybe just the large socialist uh, nations have growing economies. Well, no, also the ones with a few people, the ones with relatively few people, right? Like Vietnam, right? Comparatively few people, Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, Portugal, they have, they have fewer people in them, but they still have growing economies and they're socialist, right? Now, of course, Nicaragua also has fewer people in it. Okay, so we can draw circles around those. And this, I, and I, I changed the colors in these so we can see the diversity, right? So notice there's consistency, socialist and growing economy, but there's also diversity, Marxist or constitutionally socialist, large or small. In, these, in all of these situ situations, we've got growing economies. Of course, with that one exception, though, Nicaragua, which we're going to look at. All right, so for diversity, notice that in the, the category of D, we've strengthened diversity, right? Diversity was, was fairly strong, but now we can strengthen it even more by pointing out these, these similarities. Now, we could add other um, elements. We could bring up other features of these, these countries. For example, um, notice uh, China and Vietnam, Laos, they're all Asian countries. India, we could say, is an Asian country. Bangladesh is kind of an Asian country. Different parts of Asia. But we also include Cuba. We also include Portugal. And we also include Nicaragua. Right? These are not Asian countries. Right? They're countries in other parts of the world. European, Central American, so forth. Um, we could also, if we wanted to talk about countries with socialist leaders, that would add another group. So there are countries that don't distinctly identify themselves as socialist but they have leaders currently who identify as socialist. That would also be something that we could contribute to the argument. It would make it, the argument much more complex, but it would add analogs to the argument. Right? Okay, so that's our diversity. Now notice, when we've added those elements, when we've added those analogs, look at this, we've added another category of the similarities in the top, right? We, or we, we've not added more analogs, right? Um, or, or, yeah, I'm sorry, we've added a number of analogs, right? There are a number of similarities, excuse me, with three. Okay, now, let's look at this counterexample. You'll notice under the X, in the X column, right, uh, that is, uh, that has made our argument weak, right? The, there's a counterexample there, which is Nicaragua, which is socialist, but does not have a growing economy, right? So this weakens the argument, because there's an outlier here. We've got Nicaragua. It's socialist, but it does not have, have an economy that's growing, been growing consistently over the last decade. Now, what we can do about that is we can point out one of the reasons why in the last few years, Nicaragua has not had a growing economy. They, they've had a fairly shrinking economy. Now, we can point out, now for you, I take you to mean unrest, right? Or some kind of rebellion. And they have had a rebellion in 2018 Nicaragua experienced a rebellion from its people. The government started to step in, became and imposed some draconian measures, started to seize some offices, limited the press, and limited uh, the economy in a number of substantial ways. So this makes Nicaragua an outlier in another way, right? So in, in another way that says, hey, well, yes, there was one exception. However, this is the reason for that exception. And what would strengthen the argument is to point out that the other examples we have do not have major rebellions or widespread rebellions that have interfered with the economy. So there, now notice that that weakness. Look at the weakness in the lower right corner. It's a little bit um, less weak now, the argument, right? Because now we, that outlier, we have provided an explanation for that outlier, okay? So, but it's still, nevertheless, it's still a weakness, right? And also notice by adding this factor, adding this uh, this condition where there is un whether there is unrest or not. Notice in the first uh, seven cases, there's not unrest. There's not a huge rebellion that is damaging the economy. So now we've got four different, um, uh, well, 
yeah, three and a half different criteria, right? Um, and more than that, we've got socialism, we've got Marxist or communist identity, we've got growth of the economy, we've got large versus small, in other words, population size, and we've got whether there is widespread unrest or a widespread rebellion. All right. So we are we are gathering evidence. We are we're kind of building our our, our argument. We're making it more robust. So watch the number of similarities. Now that we've added one, the number of similarities makes the argument a little bit stronger because we're bringing in more qualities of our our evidence for the argument. Right. So the by correcting for the weakness, we've actually made the argument stronger in other ways as well. All right, so now notice between these examples of unrest, fairly similar, right? Generally, there's not a widespread rebellion, right? Okay, now, the conclusion. We want to see that the scope of the conclusion aligns with the premises, right? So one of the things we can do about this is we can say most socialist countries have growing economies, right? See what we did there, right? Now, that way, we, don't, we acknowledge that there is this outlier, Nicaragua, and we can say most socialist economies have growing economies. That could be our conclusion. Now we can also, um, we can include what we said about unrest. So notice the strength of the, the scope of the conclusion at the very bottom, move to the right a little bit. But we can also modify our argument. We can modify our, in, our conclusion to accommodate what we've brought up towards the end of the argument. We can, we can include that to bring up, we can say instead, socialist countries without widespread rebellion have growing economies, right? That would be the, the conclusion or the point. And then we can continue by saying, the economies of the four countries with Marxist governments and of the countries that are constitutionally socialist um, and without and don't have widespread rebellions in their countries grew fairly consistently over the last decade, okay? So here we see a fairly strong inductive uh, argument for the point, which is that socialist countries without widespread rebellion have growing economies. Now, we could elaborate on that if we wanted to expand and we wanted to go ahead and say healthy economies, like we had initially set out to say, we could bring in those other factors. We could look at poverty in all of these different countries. We could look at employment numbers. We could look at whether people are investing in these countries and so on and so forth. We could look at many different criteria that, that help us gauge whether an economy is indeed healthy. We could return to that. So I hope this gives you a really good illustration, a really good visualization of what it is like to analyze an inductive argument. This is applicable almost everywhere. In recent conversations, people have been talking about things like, uh, well, we are, oh, this is another thing um, that uh, is worth mentioning. When we're talking about growing consistently over the last decade, really the, uh, the numbers that I had looked at were the numbers between about 2009 and 2019. Now notice, 2009, this may also weaken the argument because 2009, many countries were recovering from the Great Recession. There was a global recession that had to do with the credit crunch um, around the world. And in, in 2009, countries were feeling the brunt of it, but then were recovering. And so we saw significant growth as a matter of recovery. So that could tip the scales a little bit uh, disadvantageously for the strength of the argument. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are growing because they're socialist. Maybe it means that they're growing because everybody was simply globally recovering. Maybe that's the case, right? So that would possibly be an exception, right, to, to the argument. Also, it, uh, the, the, the research that I had done on growing economies ends in 2019. We all know what happened in 2020, right? COVID-19 hit and there was a global economic downturn, right? And that would skew the results as well. When we are saying, if we want to say that that the, the socialist uh, economies uh, grew fairly consistently over the last decade. Well, if we're going to include 2020, not so much. Now, of course, in another sense, we could use that exception to advance the argument because there are some socialist countries whose economies did not do as poorly in 2020 as many other economies did. China is an example. China's economy was not hit as hard as many other economies. Right? So there are many factors that we could bring into this discussion about the extent to which a socialist country has, uh, so, or socialist countries have economies that are very good at growing, right? Okay, so I hope you get the gist of these different criteria that we might want to use to apply uh, to uh, analogical or inductive arguments. I hope this gives you a really good introduction.
next time we are going to oops, and in the next session we're going to talk about moral analogs which will lead to moral inductive arguments look forward to seeing you then